you have a paper titled Biological Robots, Perspectives on an Emerging Interdisciplinary Field. And the beginning, you uh, you mentioned that the word xenobots is like controversial. Did you guys get in trouble for using xenobots? Or what, do people not like the word xenobots? Are you trying to be provocative with the word xenobots versus biological robots? I don't know. This, yeah. Is there some drama that we should be aware of? So, uh, there's a little bit of drama. Uh, I, think, I think the drama is basically related to people um, having very fixed ideas about what terms mean. And I think in many cases, these ideas are completely out of date with, with where science is now. And for sure, they're, they're out of date with what's going to be. I mean, these, these, these concepts uh, are not going to survive the next couple of decades. So if you ask a person, and including um, you know, a lot of people in biology who kind of want to keep a sharp distinction between biologicals and robots, right? See, what's a robot? Well, a robot, it, it comes out of a factory. It's made by humans. It is boring. It is a meaning that you can predict everything it's going to do. It's made of metal and certain other inorganic materials. Living organisms are magical. They they, mm. they arise, right? And so on. So there's these distinctions. I think these these distinctions, I think, were, were never good, but uh, they're going to be completely useless going forward. And so part of, there's a couple of papers that that's one paper and there's another one that Josh Bongard and I wrote where we really uh, attack the terminology. And we say these binary categories are based on very um, non-essential kind of surface uh, limitations of, of technology and imagination that were true before, but they've got to go. And so, and so we call them xenobots. So so Zeno for Xenopus Lavis, where it's, it's the frog that, that these guys are made of. But we think it's an example of, 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 uh, of a biobot technology because ultimately, if we, if we under, once we understand how to uh, communicate and manipulate um, the inputs to these cells, we will be able to get them to build whatever we want them to build. And that's robotics, right? It's, it's the rational construction of machines that have useful purposes. I, I, I absolutely think that this is a robotics platform, whereas some biologists don't. But it's built in a way that uh, all the different components are doing their own computation. So in the, in the way that we've been talking about, so you're trying to do top-down control in a exactly biological right. system. And, and in the future, all of this will, will will merge together because of course, at some point, we're gonna throw in synthetic biology circuits, right? New, new, um, you know, new transcriptional circuits to get them to do new things. Of course, we'll throw some of that in, but we specifically stayed away from all of that because in the first few papers, and there's some more coming down the pike that are, uh, I think, gonna be pretty, pretty dynamite. Um, that uh, we want to show what the native cells are made of. Because what happens is, you know, if you engineer the heck out of them, right? If we were to put in new, you know, new transcription factors and some new metabolic machinery and whatever, people will say, well, okay, you engineered this and you made it do whatever and fine. I wanted to show, uh, and, and, and the whole team uh, wanted to show the plasticity and the intelligence in the biology. What does it do that's surprising before you even start manipulating the hardware in that way? Yeah, don't try to uh, over control the thing. Let it flourish. The the full beauty of the biological system. Why Xenopus levis? Levis. How do you pronounce it? The yeah, frog. Xenopus levis. Yeah, yeah. It's a very why, popular. Why this frog? It's been used since uh, I think the fifties. Uh, it's just very convenient because you can you you know we we keep the adults in this in this uh, very fine frog habitat. They lay eggs. They lay tens of thousands of eggs at a time. Um, the eggs develop right in front of your eyes. It's the most mad magical thing you can you can see because normally, you know, if you were to deal with mice or rabbits or whatever, you don't see the early stages, right? Because everything's inside the mother. Here, everything's in a petri dish at room temperature. So you just, you you have an egg, it's fertilized, and you can just watch it divide and divide and divide and on all the organs form, you can just see it. And at that point, um, the community has has developed lots of different tools for un understanding what's going on and also for for manipulating it. Right, so it's it's people use it for um, you know for understanding birth defects and neurobiology and cancer immunology. Also, so you things. get the whole uh, embryogenesis in the petri dish. Yep. That's so cool to watch. Is there videos of this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, they, uh, there's there's amazing videos on on online. I mean, mammalian embryos are are super cool too. For example, monozygotic twins are what happens when you cut a mammalian embryo in half. Yeah. You don't get two half bodies. You get two perfectly normal bodies because it's a regeneration event, right? A development is just a is just the kind of regeneration, really. And why this particular frog? It's just because uh, they were doing it in the fifties and. 
it breeds well in um you know in in it's it's easy to raise in in the laboratory and uh, it's very prolific and all the tools basically for decades people have been developing tools. There's other some people use other frogs, but I have to say this is this is this is important. Xenobots are fundamentally not anything about frogs. So um, I, I can't say too much about this because it's not published and peer reviewed yet, but we've made Xenobots out of other things that have nothing to do with frogs. It's, this is not a frog phenomenon. This is, it, it, we, we started with frog because it's so convenient, but this, this, this plasticity is not a frog, you know, it's not related to the fact that they're frogs. What happens when you kiss it? Does it turn to a prince? No, or princess, which way? Uh, prince, yeah, prince. It should be a prince, yeah. I, uh, that's an experiment that I don't believe we've done. And if we have, I don't uh, want well, to know we can about collaborate. it. collaborate. Yeah. I can take on the lead uh, okay. on that effort. Okay, okay cool. Uh, how does the cells coordinate? Let's focus in on just the embryogenesis. So there's one cell, so it divides. doesn't have to be very careful about what each cell starts doing once they divide. Yes. And like yeah. when there's three of them, it's like the co-founders or whatever. Like, what? Well, like, <laughs> slow down. You're responsible for this. When do they become specialized, and how do they coordinate that yeah. specialization? So, so this is the the basic science of developmental biology. There's a lot known about all of that, but um, but what, what I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, what I think is the mo kind of the most important part, which is, yes, it's very important who does what. However. Because going back to this issue of, of well, I made this claim that um, biology doesn't take the past too seriously. And what I mean by that is it doesn't assume that everything is the way it ex it's expected to be, right? And here's an example of that. Um, this was this was done. This was this was an old experiment going back to the 40s. But um, basically, imagine ima it's a newt, it was a salamander, and it's got these little tube tubules that go to the kidneys, right? This little tube. Take a cross section of that tube. You see eight to ten cells that have co cooperated to make this little tube in cross section, right? So one amazing tr one amazing thing you can do is. Um, you can you can mess with the very early cell division to make the cells gigantic, bigger. You can you can make them different sizes. You can force them to be different sizes. So if you make the cells different sizes, the whole newt is still the same size. So if you take a cross section through the through that tubule, instead of eight to ten cells, you might have four or five, or you might have you know three, until you make the cell so enormous that one single cell wraps around itself. And, and gives you that same large scale structure with a completely different molecular mechanism. So now instead of cell to cell co co communication to make a tubule, instead of that, it's one cell using the cytoskeleton to bend itself around. So think about what that means in the service of a large scale, it talk about top down control, right? In the service of a large scale anatomical feature, different molecular mechanisms get called up. So now think about this, you're, 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 you're a new cell and you're trying to make an embryo. If you had a fixed idea of who was supposed to do what, you'd be screwed because now your cells are gigantic. Nothing would work. The, the There's an incredible tolerance for changes in the size of the parts, in the amount of DNA in those parts, um, all sorts of stuff. You can, you can the, the life is highly interoperable. You can put electrodes in there. You can put weird nanomaterials. It still works. It's, it's, uh, th this is that problem solving action, right? It's able to do what it needs to do, even when circumstances change. That is you know, uh, the, the hallmark of intelligence, right? William James defined intelligence as the ability to get to the same goal by different means. That's this. You get to the same goal by completely different means. And so, so, so why am I bringing this up is just to say that, yeah, it's important for the cells to do the right stuff, but they have incredible tolerances for things not being what you expect and to still get their job done. So if you're, you know, um, all, all of these things are not hardwired. There are organisms that might be hardwired. For example, the nematode C. elegans, in that organism, every cell is numbered, meaning that every C. elegans has exactly the same number of cells as every other C. elegans. They're all in the same place. They all divide. There's literally a map of how it works. That in that in that sort of system, it's 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 much more cookie cutter. But but most most organisms are incredibly plastic in that way. Is there something particularly magical to you about the whole developmental biology process? Um, is there something you could say? Because you just said it. They're very good at accomplishing the goal, the job they need to do, the competency thing, but you get a freaking organism from one cell. Yeah. It's like, uh, I mean, it's very hard, hard to intuit that whole process. 
to even think about reverse engineering that process. Right, They're very hard to the point where I often just imagine. I, I, I sometimes ask my students to do this thought experiment. Imagine you were you were shrunk down to the to the scale of a single cell, and you were in the middle of an embryo, and you were looking around at what's going on. And the cells running around, some cells are dying. At the, you know, every time you look, it's kind of a different number of cells for most organisms, and so on. I think that if you didn't know what embryonic development was you would have no clue that what you're seeing is always going to make the same thing. Never mind knowing what that what that is. Never mind being able to say, even with full genomic information, being able to say, what the hell are they building? We, we have no way to do that. But but just even to guess that, wow, the, the, the outcome of all this activity is, it's always going to be, it's always going to build the same thing. The imperative to create the final you as you are now is there already. So you can, you would, so if you start from the same embryo, you would, create a very similar organism. Yeah, um, except for cases like the Xenobots, when you give them a different environment, they come up with a different way to be adaptive in that environment. But overall, I mean, so so I think so I think to, to you know, kind of um, uh, summarize it, I think what evolution is really good at is creating hardware that has a very stable baseline mode, meaning that left to its own devices, it's very good at doing the same thing. But it has a bunch of problem solving capacity such that if any if any assumptions don't hold, if your cells are a weird size or you get the wrong number of cells, or there's a you know somebody stuck an electrode halfway through the body, whatever, it will still get most of what it needs to do done. 